The other day I was on my daily walk and uh, walked by this little group coming up the hill, some moms and some little kids. And, and this one little girl, she was so, I don't know, charming that I said, hi. And she quickly hid around behind her mom, and which was probably the proper thing to do. It, but everybody chuckled when she did that. And I said to her, uh, that was probably a good idea. We all know that little kids shouldn't be talking to strangers. So why was I tempting her to talk to a stranger? Um, oops, my mistake. <laughs> I don't usually do that, but I did that time. And that little encounter became my sermon today. The, the little girl wisely did just what Jesus is talking about in four verses from chapter 10 of John. Verse 4 and 5 says, he's talking to these uh, religious leaders, he says, when he has brought out all his own, talking about his sheep, he goes before them, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. Verse 5, a stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And verse 14, he says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. So today, we're going to look at the stranger and the voice of Jesus. So who is that stranger? Jesus, of course, meant the law-keeping Pharisees. But there have been strangers all through the history of Christianity, starting from the very beginning, apparently. And recently, Dick and I have been going back and forth in emails about uh, teachings that have come down to us. Basically, I think I could be wrong, but I think from the 18th century, enlightenment when supernatural beliefs began to be an embarrassment for people who were scientifically minded. And they were embarrassing for religious leaders at the time. And so they were trying to coordinate and correlate their faith with their recent scientific discoveries and scientific theories. And their theories made a great impact on America a lot, quite a while after England, actually, and Germany. But it came over here. And it uh, picked up steam, I believe, in the 40s and 50s. At least that's when I became aware of it. I was born in 48. And I remember there was a big fervor at the time. And in the 50s, there was lots of books published. It continues to have quite an influence in America, some American Baptist churches. I, I candidated for one, and I couldn't understand what they were saying. And, and now I'm seeing it reflected in some of this information. I don't think that these... Religious leaders intended to attack Christianity. On the contrary, I think they, they were doing evangelism, I think. They were trying to do outreach, to reach people who were offended by the supernatural in our faith. They want to reform our belief in such a way that it would appeal to scientifically minded skeptical generation. Unfortunately, in order to make the gospel appealing, it seems to me that they ended up removing most of what makes a Christian. They have become strangers to me. Here's a couple of examples, quotes from Bishop Shelby Spong in his new book, A New Christianity for a New World. He says, oh wait, as I read this, bear in mind that he may be defining words differently than we normally define them. He says, the view of the cross as a sacrifice for the sins of the world is a barbarian idea based on primitive concepts of God and must be dismissed. Sounds strange to me. As I understand it, he doesn't seem to see a need for the atonement of Christ on the cross. He also said, since God can no longer be conceived in theistic terms, it becomes nonsensical to seek to understand Jesus as the incarnation of that theistic deity. So the Christology of the ages is bankrupt. And so on. I'm not sure what he means, to tell you the truth. But at any rate, he admits he's thinking up a new Christianity for a new world. And to make 
Christianity believable for this new world. People deny the virgin birth, the physical resurrection of Jesus, the inspiration of scripture, miracles, and pretty much anything supernatural about our faith. It's, well, it's like they take all the stuffing out of a teddy bear. And what do you have left? You don't have a teddy bear anymore. You have just a bag. It's got a cute little nose and little button eyes and a little heart on its chest, but doesn't have any stuffing in it anymore. It's just a bag. It's not a teddy bear. And when you take the stuffing out of Christianity, I'm not sure what you have, but I'm not think it's Christianity anymore. I think you still have the ethics, good behavior of love and justice and these kinds of things. Those are good. But you don't apparently have the salvation plainly offered in Scripture. Supernatural. Eternal life. As Paul told Timothy, they have a form of godliness but deny its supernatural power. And then there's other strangers. Nowadays, I think most of us are more familiar with these strangers. They want to make Christianity palatable for our pluralistic generation that has a a whole buffet of religions set before us and we can pick and choose which things we want to put on our plate and make up our own religion. And they usually accept the supernatural but then they want to add all sorts of mystical things like you stick things all over the teddy bear, new, new arms and new legs and maybe make a collie with, what are they, uh, it's spelled with a K, you know, the Hindu god with all the arms. <laughs> maybe you make a teddy bear with all kinds of arms on it. Adding things from Eastern religion and sometimes you just make up your own stuff that seems cool to you. Stick it on there, make your own religion up. You'd have to ask yourself, is it, is it true? You really kind of want to believe something that's true if we're talking about eternal life here. Yeah, when you sew on new parts, it becomes a strange gospel. Have you heard this old joke? What do you get when you take the body of a Chevy You take a transmission from a Ford, engine block from a Toyota, and the wheels from a sweet caddy, what do you get? About 20 years. (laughs) You you certainly don't have that sweet Chevy anymore. (laughs) You have invented another kind of vehicle. You know, the first class I took in seminary, I went to seminary to learn the truth about our our faith. And the first class I took was history of the philosophy of religion. (laughs) And it was hard for me. I I came to learn truth and I was listening to what sounded to me like a whole pile of nonsense for a whole semester. And the professor saw me and he uh, he has this doctoral from uh, Princeton, and this is old hat to him, you know, and he looks at me and he goes, Lynn, this is hard for you, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, it was hard for me. It still is. It's so oppressive to read theological speculations. Because it seems to me that the writers are really saying, I can't believe what I've been taught. So I need to formulate some theories to make it so I can believe it. I need to invent something new so that I can believe it. Because the other stuff is so unbelievable. (laughs) It, It kind of is unbelievable when you get really honest, isn't it? Jesus ascending into heaven. Are they really believing the Jesus of the gospel anymore? And what does it mean for their eternal life? And that of the people who buy into their speculations. You know, what what bothered me about it, now this is 
what bothered me in that class and continues to bother me now is I'm not kind of a logical thinker. I'm kind of a feely thinker. And so I'm really easily persuaded by smooth, convincing people. I don't know if you're like me, but when I listen to a debate, I'm going, yeah, yeah, that guy's right. That guy. And then the next guy comes up, oh, yeah, that guy's right. That's good. I believe both of them. I have a, <laughs> it doesn't work for me. I'm easily persuaded. So it scares me, these speculations. And that's when this song that Terry sang came into my mind. I heard the voice of Jesus say, Come unto me and rest. Oh, the relief to my soul to just hear the voice of Jesus. You know, the problem for us is the same as it was for the people in Jesus' day. They, they looked up to their religious leaders. They expected them to know the truth and to be teaching the truth. They had little idea that those folks were in it for the money and for the position and the nice robes and to be greeted in the marketplaces. They thought they were going to hear truth from these people. Well, Jesus was pointing out the truth about these religious leaders. It's the same today. Most people don't have the time or the really the training to check on what religious teachers are teaching us. So these scholars, pastors, and teachers, they write books and go on TV and the radio and write blogs on the internet and have websites and on and on and on. They sound smooth. They sound convincing when you read it. They sound really interesting and attractive, but they misinterpret the scriptures, handling it wrongly. Some are even antichrists. Now, I'm not just talking about uh, what we call liberals and so on. I'm talking about conservatives, too. We had a guy at seminary that was a conservative theologian, and he was completely mishandling the scripture, taking stuff out of context and ripping it apart. And unbelievable. Misinterpreting scripture, and Apostle John calls them, some of them antichrists just like they were in the days of the New Testament when it was being written. Listen to what Paul and John have to say about teachers who were rewriting the Gospels in their day. They said in Romans 16, 17 to 18, watch out for people who cause division and upset people's faith by teaching things contrary to what you've been taught. Stay away from them. Such people are not serving Christ our Lord. They're serving their own personal interests and by smooth talk, and glowing words, they deceive innocent people. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul even goes ballistic. I'm sure you've read this. And When I was teaching it in high school, I, I shouted the whole scripture. Because <laughs> that's kind of the way Paul's writing it. He's going ballistic about people who rewrite the gospel. In their day, it was talking about uh, that you had to obey Jewish laws. But it's applicable more generally as well. He says, I'm shocked that you are turning away so soon from God who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but is not the good news at all. You're being fooled by those who deliberately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preach to you. I say again what we said before. If anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. My goodness, I certainly wouldn't go that far. But of course, Paul had been stoned by these people, so naturally he's pretty upset. Contrary to all those invented Christianities that he was opposing, Paul goes on to tell where he got his good news from. He writes, now I want you to know, brothers, that the gospel preached by me was not based on human thought. I did not receive it from a human source, and I was not taught it. It came by revelation from Jesus Christ. Now, John was also defending it. I think most of the letters really are about defending the gospel. So John was also doing that. He defended the truth about Jesus to his churches. 
He tells them in 1 John 4, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit. To test the spirits to determine if they're from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. You are from God, little children, and you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who's in the world. They are from the world. Therefore, what they say is from the world and the world listens to them. We are from God. Anyone who knows God listens to us. Anyone who is not from God does not listen to us. From this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of deception. It's like Jesus told those religious leaders in his day who were leading the people astray. He's speaking of himself as a good shepherd. So then he says this, the sheep follow him for they know his voice. He's talking about himself in the third person there. The sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they'll flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Yeah, I think it's wise to be afraid of these strangers. I think it's wise to run away because they can hurt us. Even so, God has raised up scholars who are trained and able to engage with these speculators on an educational level. And you can watch these debates and read four views on the atonement or there's different books. People have been raised up for this ministry. Paul was one of those. He, uh, he said he, this is a quote from Paul, he says he demolishes arguments and every high-minded thing that's raised up against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive to obey Christ. But let's be honest, most people aren't called to that kind of ministry. They're not equipped for it. <laughs> I know I'm not. I'm not equipped to demolish arguments. So I would counsel most believers when listening to religious leaders to go ahead, be on your guard, listen to what they have to say with a, a wisely critical mind. Even if they're interesting and appealing and attractive, don't drop your, what Joanne calls her spot of flake antenna. Keep your antenna up looking for flakes. Test the spirits. See who is talking through that leader. Who is it? If they seem to be teaching a gospel other than what historically, traditionally has been brought down to us through thousands of years. And if you don't feel equipped to engage with them, then don't give them the time of day. Walk away, turn the TV off, whatever you need to do if you're not equipped to deal with it. As Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. All right. I don't want to talk about strangers anymore. I'd rather think about that supernatural voice that, of Jesus that we follow. The voice of Jesus is in the Bible. It teaches us and encourages us by revealing his will and his heart in the words he caused to be written in there. The voice of Jesus is love through other people, as we talked about earlier today. John encourages us then to love one another. Because love is from God. The voice of Jesus can come to us through people who come to us. Through loving words and actions. Sometimes just by being there. The voice of Jesus sometimes comes through circumstances. And things we observe in our environment as we've been talking about. Or things that we read or things that we watch. We can hear the voice of Jesus. It will suddenly occur to us that we're, oh, I'm seeing something. God do something here. Or maybe he's put a thought in your mind about something. Like this, studying this, uh, this speculative theology, it scares me. So God keeps giving me scriptures that says, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. Work through it. You'll find out what's wrong with it. <laughs> and I found some things, I think. But anyway, you, he actually speaks to your mind. Like God promised the Israelites in, in exile, 
in Isaiah 30. He says, your eyes will see your teacher and whenever you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear this command behind you. This is the way, walk in it. And that means the voice of Jesus also speaks directly to your thoughts. But how can you tell which thoughts are from Jesus? Thoughts in your head come from all sorts of sources. How can you tell? Some of them are even spiritual influences. Sometimes even Satan and his demons can put thoughts in your head. Condemning you for something that they shouldn't be condemning you for. Or or lying to you about who knows what. Sometimes about other people. Sometimes about yourself. But the Bible also promises that God will put his very own spirit into what we call our hearts or our minds or our lives or whatever you want to call it, that part of us. I'll just stick with hearts. That spirit of the Father is is the voice of Jesus. We love him and we want to follow him because we recognize that voice. That's that's a lot going on in our heads. (laughs) So how can you tell which is the voice of Jesus in your head? What's what's it like? How can you identify it? Well, the voice of Jesus is loving. It doesn't beat you down. It isn't oppressive. It doesn't belittle you. If there's a voice like that in your head, that's not Jesus. Don't listen to it. It's probably a lie or an exaggeration or some ancient regret condemning you once again. And if you hear that, or someone else ridiculing someone, you know it's not from Jesus, it's some other spirit. Jesus' voice is gentle. He said, I am humble in heart and you'll find rest for your souls. Yeah, he can be persuasive, but it doesn't feel like he's pressuring you. He doesn't urgently insist that you do something immediately or something terrible will happen. That's not the voice of Jesus. He wants you to think about what you do. God has all the time in the world. He's not in a big old hurry. But he's giving you an opportunity sometimes to join him in his work. And when he gives you this opportunity, sometimes he needs to persistently persuade you because you're reluctant. It's, sometimes these things are uncomfortable. But he'll keep... It's not pressure, though. It's just reminding you. And, and it comes with a sense of, I don't know what, joy or, or a sense of, adventure or opportunity or sometimes it's even fun it has this wouldn't it be fun if you did help somebody do so and so Jesus voice is positive and peaceful it gives a sense that things are under control I don't need to worry it'll turn out for good in the end Jesus voice does not include a feeling that all is lost It doesn't come with despair. That's not the voice of Jesus. Jesus' voice is forgiving and encouraging. It's supportive, even when he's reminding us of a sin that we need to stop in our lives or in lives of others, some some behavior that's going to hurt. Think about it. Who was he harsh with in the Gospels? He wasn't harsh with the people who believed him. He was harsh with those who rejected him. He's harsh with people who wanted to hurt other people. That's who he's harsh with. Not with believers. He's he's not going to be harsh with you. Nothing you do surprises him. Even though it may cause you despair of ever improving, it doesn't surprise him. Yeah, he wants us to grow in holiness, and and that's what he's helping us to do. He wants us to stop behaviors that are hurtful, yes. But he won't condemn you. Instead, he invites you to accept his power, his transforming power to change your life, coming from him. Jesus' voice is not fuzzy, It's not confusing. It's clear and distinctive and decisive. If it's about sin in your life, it won't be generally about what a bad person you are. It will be something very specific that you need to stop and he gives you direction on how to make it better, how to make it right. Like if you've hurt somebody's feelings, he'll tell you what to say. 
It's very distinctive, his voice. Very specific. And when Jesus wants you to do something, he'll leave no doubt about it. Now, once I say that, I need to back up a little bit. We've got lots of voices coming into our heads, and some of them come with no doubt about it. But sometimes they're still wrong. <laughs> you need to check with the body of Christ, with other mature believers, to make sure that this is a voice of the Lord. Check with circumstances and other people before you dive into something. We're easily deceived. That's why we need the community of Christ to bounce our thoughts off of. Jesus' voice is a great relief. His voice is not dark and depressing. It's not oppressive. It doesn't press down on your heart. Some people accept this condemning and deceptive voice to such a degree they commit suicide. Christians who have accepted this condemnation in their hearts, it's not from the Lord. Jesus' voice is like warm sunlight on a cool morning, like love and all things helpful and beautiful. That's Jesus' voice. Do you know that voice of Jesus today? You can ask him into your heart right now. He'll be there for you. He'll strengthen you. He will not let you be snatched out of his hand. You don't have to worry about that. Stay in the peace of Jesus. Paul wrote to the Romans, Now all glory to God who is able to make you strong. Just as my good news says. All glory to the only wise God through Jesus Christ forever. Amen.